in action. I'm Sean. I'm Michael. And uh, we did uh, chapter 16, which is for and direct investment. So a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. We'll be talking about the economic impacts on GTC, global trends in FDI, why do firms invest overseas, cross-border mergers and acquisitions, political risk in FDI, and the problem. And we're going to, we'll, we'll do a practice problem. Uh, so just to start off with, we have a economic impact. Um, two things that GTC needs to do is they want to pursue FDI to acquire foreign businesses. Um, and GC, GTC needs to closely evaluate potential FDI opportunities. Um, as we'll talk about later, there's a lot of factors um, that will contribute to why GTC um, needs to look so closely to evaluate which uh, potential FDI is the right match for our company. Um, two options that we have is GTC can diversify their portfolio with up to six different countries uh, developed and developing um, to decrease potential future risk and increase uh, shareholder wealth um, and shareholder satisfaction. Uh, GTC will also have the option of acquiring smaller financial facilities in London, China, and Tokyo uh, to hedge the risk from unanticipated changes in currency uh, up to 8% over the next five years. So the basic definition of foreign direct investment is when uh, an investment is made by a company into another country to acquire business uh, activities. And FDI flows represent the new additions to the existing stock of an FDI. If you look at the chart below, this is um, Exhibit 16.1 in our textbook. It um, represents the top 10 countries for both FDI inflows and outflows. And uh, you'll notice that the top 10 countries account for 62% of worldwide FDI outflows, as well as 45% worldwide FDI. FDI inflows. Uh, the two most prominent countries for FDI are the US and China. And uh, multinational corporations like China a lot because um, they see it as an opportunity for cheap labor as well as efficient manufacturing infrastructure. And uh, two other countries that are rising in prominence in FDI are Mexico and Spain. Mexico because uh, it's also a source of cheap labor uh, while China has rising uh, minimum wage rates. And then Spain also because of their low production rates for um, the whole European Union. And uh, FDI stocks are an accumulation of previous FDI flows. They best capture cross-border production for MNCs. And the three major uh, economic uh, stocks for FDI stock are the US, Japan, and the European Union. Um, so why do firms invest overseas? Of course, there's a lot of reasons to invest, uh, especially given the industry. Um, there may be different influences and factors, uh, but the book provided a general overview um, as to why they could invest. Um, a lot, uh, especially now, a big conversation is local or global. Um, firms are trying to decide whether or not they want to produce locally, um, sell locally, uh, operate locally, or <coughs> they should expand globally. Um, this is because of a shift of consumer taste, um, transaction costs, political environment. Um, extensive list and they extending globally uh, can represent an extension of their corporate control um, globally um, Heidelberger and Heimer uh, were two theorists uh, or uh, people who thought of this um, started first thinking of this why that's overseas um, and mostly their theories uh, are centered around market imperfections um, the three are product, factor, and capital market imperfections. Um, and then what I'm going to talk about are the factors um, of why uh, firms should engage in FDI. So first are trade barriers and imperfect labor conditions. Um, trade barriers can take the form of tariffs, quotas, embargoes, um, and they can be government created and they can be natural trade barriers. Um, I think we focus a lot on the government created um, because those can be uh, more predictable. Sometimes we can see trends um, and the relationships between governments um, are pretty noticeable. Um, governments would want to impose trade barriers, uh, tariffs, uh, or quotas um, to protect their domestic industries. Um, or carry out further economic or political objectives uh, that they might have. Whereas natural barriers uh, are primarily the high export costs. Um, book talked a little bit about how you wouldn't 
um, the U.S. wouldn't have a concrete uh, manufacturer exporting concrete um, and other heavy materials to the U.S. because just high transportation costs um, would not make the um, venture profitable. Um, next, we're going to talk about imperfect labor markets. Um, out of all of the factor markets, labor markets are the uh, most imperfect, um, and companies move to pursue the lowest labor cost they can, um, given manufacturing production. Um, those are the primary industries where they see labor markets, um, but marketing, um, consultation, um, IT, things like that are also being um, pursued overseas. Um, and these vast imperfections between countries create uh, wage differentials um, between each country. Um, and as we'll see, eventual rises in wages cause shifts um, between which countries are more heavily invested in. Um, the book had a, a pretty long table, extensive table of countries, but I thought that the high point um, was that Switzerland was the highest uh, per hour manufacturing uh, rate with 60.4 uh, US dollars, and Bangladesh was the lowest with 37 cents per hour. Um, Sweden was also pretty high up with $49 per hour, and then uh, the second lowest was Vietnam uh, with 73 cents um, per dollar per hour. Uh, the next two are intangible assets and vertical integration. Um, intangible assets can be technology, R&D, uh, marketing, managerial knowledge, um, <coughs> or just other processes that have, give you a comparative advantage. Um, a lot of firms are worried about a boomerang effect, which is essentially they invest in a country um, and maybe they do a franchise or they allow production of their product in that country. Um, and then the country, given that there's corruption and um, maybe lower legal laws um, and less um, punishment of copying a product, will then take that plan and manufacture the product for a cheaper price and create a knockoff. Um, so that's why a lot of foreign firms will instead uh, fully invest or do a joint venture and create foreign subsidies. Um, and again, this is, it's because it's in a lot of firm, or countries where um, manufacturing is cheap, um, they'll, it'll also be hard to protect their intangible assets, um, and they want to protect those uh, resources. Uh, the book provides an example of Coca-Cola in India, essentially Coca-Cola is in India. There's a lot of pressure for Coca-Cola to release their plans, um, but instead of just uh, dealing with the uh, corrupt environment, which is pulled out of India um, and sacrifice the uh, lower labor costs and manufacturing costs. Next is vertical integration. Um, firms mostly integrate for price stability uh, to create barriers and for cost savings. Um, this can take the form of mergers and acquisitions. Um, and typically firms uh, or people in business think of backward integration, um, which is where the industry abroad uh, produces uh, inputs for the multinational corporation. Um, but the book also suggested that forward integration uh, could be a good solution as well, uh, whereas the firm uh, relies on a the multinational corporation relies on the firm abroad um, to sell their product. And then the final two are product lifecycle and shareholder diversification services. I'm actually going to talk about shareholder diversification services first. Um, and these are take the format of direct diversification services. Um, essentially, firms can diversify their portfolio um, with other countries' um, stocks and funds. And this indirectly benefits shareholders because um, shareholders have a diversified portfolio that they can benefit from, um, but they don't directly bear any risk, uh, just the company bears risk. And this isn't necessarily a efficient method um, because of international capital flows, um, but it does create a portfolio that's internationally diverse. Um, it 
is a lot of company or countries. Um, but there is again uh, not as much firm motivation uh, to do this because it doesn't typically directly uh, impact the firm, and it's just not as relevant, especially now. And then product life cycle um, basically talks about how FDI. Um, takes place in particular stages of the PLC curve. Uh, we have all studied the PLC curve, uh, so we know how it works pretty much. Um, but essentially when they choose to introduce new products, they keep them close to consumers, <laughs> is what theorists uh, suggest. Um, and there's three main stages. Uh, the early stage is demand is intensive compared to price. Um, the middle is exporting begins, and then later uh, firms begin standardizing their products and <coughs> There's further foreign production uh, after the product has reached uh, maturity. And then on the next slide, we'll talk about um, just a close up of PLC curve. Um, so, like I talked about, uh, this straight line that you can't see um, represents consumption. And this blue line here represents production by the firm. Um, in the beginning, there's rising production, it's high production and a firm is exporting a lot of their production, whereas later when the product has reached maturity, um, firms begin to rely on standardization and they allow foreign uh, production and the firm begins importing. Um, there is suggested that this is what all firms should attain to achieve. Um, and then we see that less advanced countries, um, developing countries, emerging uh, countries, um, it's almost the opposite. They consume with kind of a curve, um, and then they initially rely on importing and then switch to exporting. Um, so I'll be talking about cross border mergers and acquisitions. And this is when um, the combining or the buying of foreign businesses and um, mergers and acquisitions currently accounts for more than 50% of FDI flows in terms of dollar amount. Um, so two main advantages are speed and access to proprietary assets. Um, and there's also been an increase in mergers and acquisitions due to the liberalization of the capital market and the integration of the world market, of the world economy. Um, so this helps protect, consolidate, and advance global competitive position because um, companies can either acquire the assets of another company that um, they find valuable, or they can use their own assets on a larger scale. Um, assets acquired from another firm, such as technical competence, um, established brand names, and existing supplier networks and distribution systems can be put to immediate use towards better serving global customers, um, enhancing profits, profits, expanding market share, and increasing corporate competitiveness. Um, but this hasn't always proven successful. Um, and in the book, it talks about the Daimler and Chrysler merger. So Daimler is a multi, uh, multinational automotive corporation um, that's based in Germany. And Chrysler is a car company from the United States. And so they merged in hopes of reducing um, annual cost by, I think, $3 billion annually. And um, the stock prices of both companies rose initially because they thought that it was something that was actually going to be very beneficial. The, the savings, technological synergies, and enhanced marketing power that both sides envisioned did not end up materializing. And then this caused Daimler to sell off Chrysler um, for $7 billion to um, Cereba. Cereba. Um, and so synergistic gains are um, what's most, um, what is, like what you want when you have a merger acquisition. And this is when the um, combined value of the companies is larger than the independent value of both companies. Um, and then um, I'll be talking about some um, studies that have been done. So the first one was by Dukas and Travelis. Um, and they were looking at the impact of international acquisitions on stock prices. And so they found that Shareholders in both um, shareholders of U.S. Um, bidders experience <coughs> significant positive abnormal returns when firms expand to new industries and geographic markets. And then um, Harris and Raven, Ravencraft looked at shareholder wealth gains for U.S. firms acquired by foreign markets, 
and they found um, that the U.S. experienced higher wealth gains when they're um, when they have a merger and acquisition with a company that's outside of the U.S. compared to um, merging with a company inside of the U.S. And then Morgan Young um, looked at the effect of international acquisitions on stock prices of U.S. firms, and so they saw that U.S. acquiring firms with information based on tangible assets experienced a significant positive stock price reaction upon foreign acquisition. So political risk and FDI. Political risk is defined as potential losses to the parent firm resulting from adverse political developments in a host country. And depending on the size of the political event and how much of an area it affects, it can be a macro risk or a micro risk. So a macro risk is defined as when all foreign operations are affected by adverse political developments in a host country. And an example of that would be um, in 1949, when the Communist Party won the um, won in China, they had a political victory that affected all China. And then uh, micro risk is defined as when only selected areas of foreign business operations are affected. And uh, an example of this would be Enron in the early 2000s. Uh, they decided to build the largest ever power plant in India, and uh, they were 300 million dollars into the project. And then the Nationalist, Nationalist Party in India decided to cancel the project midway through. So Enron lost $300 million for almost no reason. And that's just like a quick example of micro risk. Um, and then when it comes to political risk, there are three types of risk. There's transfer risk, which is defined as an uncertainty, uncertainty about cross-border flows from capital payments. And an example of this would be unexpected imposition of capital controls. Uh, there's operational risk, which is associated with uncertainty about the host country's policies. And an example of this would be uh, changes in environmental policies or minimum wage laws. And then the last uh, type of risk is control risk, which is defined as an uncertainty about the host country's policies regarding ownership and control of local operations. And an example of this is restrictions imposed on the maximum ownership shared by foreigners. And then uh, when it comes to political risk, there are six uh, defining factors for it. So the first one is the host country's political and government system. If a country has too many political parties and frequent changes in government, their political risk increases. The second is track records of political parties and their relative strength. So an example of this would be um, if the country you want to invest in has a political views of socialism, then they're probably a higher risk to invest in have high political risk. But if they're more liberal, then they have a lower political risk. Uh, the third key factor is integration into the world system. And if a country is isolated and segmented, <coughs> then they're less willing to cooperate with other countries, which increases their political risk. The fourth is the host country's ethnic and religious stability. And uh, basically domestic peace is obviously a factor when it comes to um, affecting political risk. It can, if there is violence uh, due to religion or something like that, then political risk will severely increase. Uh, the next is regional security. And that just means potential aggression from a neighboring country is a major source of political risk. And then the sixth one is economic indicators. And uh, political events are usually triggered by economic situations. And uh, that could be anything from poverty rates and inflation rates to interest rates. And finally, um, how to manage political risk. So the first uh, approach you can do is the conservative approach. And that just means you can incorporate political risk into capital budgeting processes and adjust the NPV accordingly. And what this means is that basically um, political risk is diver diversified diversifiable, and uh, if you have um, a portfolio, you can diversify into different countries, which will decrease the political risk. Of, so it's just basic asset allocation. Uh, you can form a joint venture with a local company. So if a project is partially owned by a local company, then the foreign government is less inclined to expropriate it, since uh, this action will hurt the local company along with the MNC. And uh, you could, MNCs can also use local debt to finance their projects. Uh, you can purchase insurance against the hazard of political risk. And in the United States, we have the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the OPIC. <coughs> Their main goal is basically to get US, the U.S. to develop, to invest into developing countries. And uh, they offer insurance against um, a number of things, the first being uh, inconvertibility of foreign currencies, uh, expropriation of U.S.-owned assets overseas, destruction of U.S.-owned physical properties due to war, and other violent political events, and also loss of business income due to political violence. Uh, finally, you can avoid bribery and corruption. Uh, the Foreign Corrupt, Corrupt Practices Act, uh, it was established in the 90s, and this uh, basically does not, it outlaws any US officials to uh, 
make corrupt deals with <coughs> other nations. And then there's also the Corruption and Perceptions Index, which is just an index people can use to tell if um, a country is uh, going through a corruption phase or not. And also, um, avoiding breach payments can cause companies to lose business, but it also lowers, lowers their political risk. And a breach payment is just um, an illegal deal with another country. So uh, our the chapter wasn't really number based, so um, it's more like of a kind of like discussion. So you guys have fun yourself. But for DTC, what are the main motivations when looking into FDI? What are the main beneficiaries, and what are the main risks that should be taken into account when looking at FDI? <coughs> so if you guys want to discuss more yourselves for a couple minutes, three or four, uh, three or four minutes, then we'll come back and. Uh, Yes. 